Greetings, all. Let's look, I'm going to do a little gallery view, see everybody. Nice to see everybody. How's it going? Uh, fun, fun, fun. Some many familiar faces. Um, so I'll just start in maybe we'll you know some other folks will uh, trickle in but we might as well start a chatting um we talked about this a little bit before and i remember uh in 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 conversation with chris um so it, some of it is, is territory that's familiar but it's been on my mind more lately um which is that i i listened to the entire power trip podcast uh, that was made with uh, uh, two folks from Symposia and New York Magazine, uh, a, a kind of glorious muckraking of psychedelic therapy, both underground and overground with maps, uh, raising a lot of heinous behaviors and certainly have a lot of re uh, uh, fuel for their attacks. Um, you know, I had a number of issues with the, the way the, the, the series was done, and I suspect some of you are familiar with it and some of you aren't, um, but I am happy to go into more detail in the, in the q and I don't really want to talk about the specific stories or the, you know, the way they decided to approach things. Um, everyone, if you're just arising, arriving, <clears throat> I'm talking about, uh, uh, the Power Trip podcast about um, a kind of uh, excoriating critique of psychedelic therapy. But what I want to talk about now is this question of, of power and autonomy. And I'm really exploring this one, um, both for intellectual and personal and practice reasons. And I'm interested in the way that psychedelics can uh, present an interesting analog to some of the problems of power, of submission, of autonomy, of control that also are raised inside of spiritual practice, particularly spiritual practice in community and particularly spiritual practice with a teacher. And just to put my confused cards in a heap on the table, um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm pretty interested in independence and autonomy. And I think one of the challenges that we're going through right now, and I think one of the reasons that uh, the psychedelic therapists that are critiqued in this episode went so south uh, and why they could go so south is still really wrestling with what we could call the kind of guru model. And on the one hand, I think it's fair to say that after the excesses of the last few decades, that there are many people, particularly on the more kind of uh, post-rationalist or sort of secular end of these things who uh, are very content to sort of leave the guru model behind and to insist that we, have our, we are gonna discover our own truth, that it's ultimately up to us, that we can have helpers and mentors and, and teachers to a degree along the way, but that there are a number of very clear warning signs about um, power and authority inside of spiritual relationships and that we should be you know, very wary of that. And I think that model works for a lot of people. And I think a lot of the criticisms are, are very true. But for a number of reasons, I'm not willing to let go of the, um, the particular kind of magic that is available in situations of uh, submission, play, not knowing, uh, uh, risk, danger. Um, and when I look at some of those guru scenes that people are very content simply to critique, 
today, mostly kind of as a historian and also someone who has a kind of fondness for, for the absurdity and excesses of the 60s and 70s that I'm just going to be completely open about. There's something in that that I still find romantic, even though I can see very clearly the troubling and, and damaging aspects of some of that material. Um, but there's something more. I mean, I, my, I guess my question, and it's kind of an intuition, is that it see, I suspect that there are things that you, you can't do without some of that kind of risk, meaning there are, there are places you can't go. There are transformations that are foreclosed to you without a certain sort of, of uh, risk with a kind of power play, if you will, with someone else who knows. And at the same time, I want to feel like that there's a way to, to minimize the kind of excesses that you find uh, are, so, are so damaging. And, you know, nothing makes me more angry than really manipulative spiritual leaders who take advantage of people's naivete and their um, brokenness and their need for uh, certainty and their need for parents and their need for a substitute parent. And I remember one of the things that really changed for me after I uh, formally, you know, got a PhD in studying religion is that I had, I came away with more sympathy for seekers and believers of all stripes. Like I came away with the sense that this is something that's really deep in human being, not for all of us, but for a lot of us in various ways, and that we have to respect and accept it as a part of human experience, at least collectively. Um, and at the same time, I was even less forgiving for the kinds of manipulation and, and um, lying and <laughs> abuse and control games and mind fucking that can happen inside of small religious sects. It can happen on the level of large, more mainstream religions. And so, as, as I said, I'm, I'm somewhat conflicted about, uh, about these matters. And, um, you know, and then I say that also as somebody who has like, you know, a Roshi, you know, I don't just have a meditation teacher who's teaching me a sort of method that ultimately leads to my own discoveries. That's all true because that's part of Zen. If it's, if it's only your ideas about somebody else, it's not cutting it. What you're going for is some kind of immediate first person, can't put it back in the box, isn't a thought, sort of grok, and it's right there. And yet that happens partly through this community and this relationship with a teacher. And that's a lot of what koans are about. It's like in almost every koan, there's like a teacher and a student. And sometimes a student out teaches the teacher. There's some play there for sure. But there's something about that relationship that's seen as very dynamic. And the way that I've come to think about it lately and it's not sufficient, but I think it's interesting. And it, this gets ties back into with the idea of psychedelics is it has to do with risk. That the mistake that people make is to think that, oh, well, these, are, these situations should be assured. We should know that this person that we're giving some of our power over to is going to handle it well, like we would if, if there's someone as a board certified therapist and knows that there are certain rules like don't fuck your clients, you know, and then in like the power trip episodes, we hear about psychedelic therapists who are, you know, working in this much more intense, affective, you know, potentially delusional, potentially uh, very easily manipulable space, and then also fucking their clients. So you're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's super ungroovy, guys. I think we can all kind of agree upon that. But it, it does seem to me that there's something in the in some kinds of spiritual relationships where there is a quality of danger and risk. And that's part of what it is about. That's part of what the power is, the power that's both given and received and transformed. And, you know, this is, very, this is kind of dangerous talk these days because a lot of people don't 
they either think this is wrong, what I'm saying, that it's a, a part of a sickness or a disease inside of human beings that they want to control people. And this is the kind of bullshit they use in order to justify it. Um, you know, so I can I can even kind of see their point of view. And, and I think for a lot of people, that's probably the best way to think about it. But I can't put it back in the box entirely. And so rather than say, no, the guru is necessary for your enlightenment. I'm not going to say anything like that. How would I know that? But it's more like certain situations, certain relationships have a kind of risk in them, which means that things can go south, that also provide certain kinds of magic, even if it's just in the moment, that nothing else can really do. And here I'm thinking of, I mean, it's kind of a weird example, but in actually, in a lot of ways, it's actually a really appropriate, which is like, which is kink, like the kink scene, like the way in which they have grown, uh, uh, people in that scene have grown to develop very sophisticated ways of playing with power. And if you're doing it right, it's mostly pretty safe. You know, even though they're obviously if there's, if it's completely safe in a way, you're, you're losing a little bit of the grain of it, a little bit of the risk, a little bit of the taboo, a little bit of the tantra uh, of the thing. And, you know, that's why it's like, it's kind of hard to talk about because it's like, you know, if you if we were all just sitting in like a little room and having this conversation to be one thing, and if I was standing in front of a, a crowd of a thousand people who were like, uh, you know, people who are just turning into psychedelic therapy, it wouldn't necessarily be very appropriate because in a way it's kind of an esoteric thing, the way that kink is sort of esoteric. Yes, it's available. Yes, it's accessible. It's not seen as a horrible perversion anymore, but it's still kind of off over here where people are playing a stronger game with stronger flavors and with to some degree more risk not hopefully not the kind of risk where people can abuse people easily but the kind of risk where you might go farther than you're comfortable with and then you might have to go gosh was i really comfortable with that was that really my decision was it not my decision because of course all of these problems of power are also problems of subjectivity of identity of who we are uh who we think we are and while I think most of the time it's very important to, to maintain that autonomy, and an idea, indeed when I listen to the people in the, in the power trip particularly and the clients who went into these situations, they mostly sound, a lot of them sound pretty broken to me on the one hand and on the other hand kind of naive. Like they're going into situations sort of believing the hype and it made me realize that there's a kind of... Um, there's a sort of a weird generosity and cynicism or, or in, in skepticism, I'll say, but with a little bit of cynicism, like I walk into a situation and someone's putting on the therapy guy zone, you know, the therapy uh, knowing quality. And I don't buy it. I'm already like an anti, I'm like, no, you know, maybe we can have a conversation. Maybe over time I will come to respect this. But my initial response is always like, nah, yeah. Sorry, we're all on our own. And that can be really protective and allow you to go farther in certain relationships. And that, you know, in that sense, I, I really buy part of what the whole purpose of this series is, which is a weird, it's a weird thing to happen. Because on the one hand, it's, I have a lot of problems with the little, with elements of it, innovations and sort of philosophical underpinnings, partly around the things that I'm talking about now. But at the same time, on the larger ecology of what's happening with psychedelic therapy, I think it's actually great because anything that's going to increase the naive public's skepticism about the kinds of power relations that they are going to get themselves involved in at this point, at this desperate, the shit show is just starting, folks, point is actually a good thing. So while I don't agree with how it's being directed in some ways, I think in some ways it's, it's also good and certainly inevitable. So, um, so then part of the reason, so I've been thinking about this, I've talked about this kind of spiritual relationship. And I remember I came out of, I had a teacher in the, or I thought I had a teacher 20 years ago and it was, went on for years. And then it's just, it wasn't quite right. I don't know the details about it, but something was just off. And finally, there was just one kind of insight where I just saw that in some ways I had never really been this person's student. They had never really been my teacher. It was all kind of hollow. And in some ways I was never gonna get 
what I wanted out of the situation. So I just abandoned it. And in some ways, I kind of abandoned the idea of having a teacher. And I became more sort of conversant with the anarchist, autonomist idea of sort of wake up together, wake up spirituality is essentially a peer to peer relationship. Like, right, you know, you guys like to hear me talk. I've got a certain kind of set of experiences and articulate things well, but I do, I'm not here as a te teacher exactly, or I am, but it's sort of like a, oh, I'll put the teacher hat on now for the next 45 minutes and then let's have a conversation. I'll take it off. And, you know, that's very, that's very home base for me, that kind of peer to peer relationship. And when I look at my own life, when I think about, come on, where, where are the real spiritual downloads and the real spiritual relationships? And most of them are peer to peer. They're like maybe people who are a little bit older, they're more like a mentor, they're like an older brother, or the older brother's friend who turns you on to a record. It's like that kind of like, sort of lateral up relationship as opposed to a you know, a clear teacher student relationship. But for whatever reason, I always kept a part of my brain going, yeah, but don't get total out. I was like, I always reserved a piece of my brain and I put it these terms. I, I, if I fall, if I find a teacher that I fall in love with, that's okay. And I use that metaphor really intentionally because it reminds us in this whole other domain, I mean, in a way we're coming around to kink again in terms of Eros and the role of submission and magic and lack of control and potential danger and potential vulnerability in Eros as being not a bad metaphor for some aspects of spiritual relationship. So uh, by saying fall in love with the teacher, it's like, yeah, and remember that's sort of the way that you will have fallen in love in the past, sometimes wonderfully, sometimes treacherously, usually both, but that, that it, the part of the way in which we accept the madness of love as part of the valuation of life, something that's worth doing, that's worth risking, that's worth being vulnerable for, there's something about that in the particular relationship with, with a teacher. And I didn't think that I really would find a teacher again, and I did. And by fall in love, I don't mean like, oh, I'm devoted. And he's like, da, da, da. it's more like I just got more and more intrigued and more and more intrigued and watched the whole scene and watched with other people. And over time started to like get to this point where I could feel like a, a real student and, and be OK with being a student. And I'm still working on it. I'm still not trustful. I'm still that's part of the part of the process is this unfolding thing and I can see the way that like oh yeah that could that kind of idea that could go south in the wrong situation but in a way that's kind of part of what I'm I'm pointing towards and uh my, my again my gut feeling is that you can't really formalize that kind of magic the way you can't really formalize love um, and that it, it is dangerous from the outside. If you want to try to formalize it and, and, and create a system of accountability and, you know, a peer review and uh, a board certification and all those kind of procedures by which we try to constrain the almost inherent craziness of power relations, particularly when there's some kind of sacred seeking uh, or ecstasy or altered states involved. I mean, those are all like high danger situations for power relations. And so you want to try to tamp it down. And I, I think those things should happen. They, 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 there should be those bureaucracies in mass. But at the same time, I don't want to, I can't say that 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 more informal situation should be should be uh, done away with. Um, and so I'm ambivalent uh, in, in the sense of like not really being sure about what to, you know, what to land on, what to approve, what to critique, what to preserve space for. Um, and, but I feel like it has partly to do with how we also trust our own sense of autonomy in relationship. Like, what does it mean to build up a sense of your own confidence, your own energy, your own sort of, um, uh, sense of of balance such that it, you can, you can go deeper into situations of submission and this is where the example of psychedelics not with a guide i mean that's one of the funny things for me about 
when I'm thinking about what's the, this problem with psychedelic guides and psychedelic therapy and the shit it show or that's coming is like, I, I never really did that. You know, I did, I've done one formal session. I did, I, you know, I've done some ayahuasca circles with shaman, but I didn't really like, they weren't like my teacher. They were facilitators who, who did kind of amazing things and kind of sort of absurd things at different points in the ceremony. So I was never really that interested in psychedelics as like something that would be mediated by some other person who had a huge amount of charisma, although I did meet some crazy psychedelic warriors along the way. And some of them were sort of dangerous and some sort of crazy. And I learned from them and I enjoyed having those encounters. Some of them were kind of fucked up, you know, and I, I don't know what to do with that. Like, ah, I was kind of fucked up, but it was sort of awesome. And, and I, I, I was lucky maybe, or I was privileged, or I was somehow protected something somehow by my own upbringing, or I'm not sure, I really don't know, you know, um, how to, how to square uh, that kind of thing. But, but leaving aside the question of like a psychedelic guide, uh, and sorry about the light on my face, but here we are. Um, leaving aside the question of the psychedelic guide, psychedelics themselves, offer this other kind of zone of both developing self-power and submitting to the unknown, just in that relationship with a high dose experience where you're very aware that you're holding and you're gripping and you're being asked to submit. And yet there's still something on the other side of that submission that involves your own autonomy or your own guidance, your own uh, navigational skills. You know, and that's why it's not just a full submission. And there's some things you don't want to submit to. I mean, you know, this is this gets down to one of the big, big uh, colons of psychedelic journeying, which is that if really like scary, gnarly stuff comes up and you have any degree of of control over the situation, what are you supposed to do? You know, and some people say, go for it, go into it, go into the demon's mouth, take it on. It's all good. It's all for the light. It's, 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 you know, that it's all about integrating the shadow and going through the shadow. Maybe that's certainly not an indigenous approach and it's not a magical approach, you know, where you're like, ah, you, you, you got your relations here. There's this is, and there's that. So if, if they're, pulling that move you want to have this juju going in you know, but you got to be on your toes it's a different kind of framework than a sort of kind of cheap Jungian mode where you're just like yeah take it on so even when you're when there's a quality of submission there's still this question of navigation do i go down the dragon's mouth do i take the object proffered by the underwater fairy lady you know, there's these little micro moves or where, where do I focus my energy or I'm feeling fear? What do I, you know, so there, that navigational quality is still part of your own autonomy, even though you're in the midst of this weird situation. And, and so I think that one way that this is similar is that both the psychedelic experience and the kind of, let's say, magical relationship with the teacher, you know, where it's not just formalized or, or the person is just like a uh, teaching a method or teaching you a, a kind of philosophy or it's very, you know, well-contained, but rather it's in a sort of create, you know, like more like a crazy wisdom teacher, like going up to Osho's ashram in 1978 or something. And it's just a crazy freak show. And you have no idea like everybody's on these different trips and it's just super wild that's an extreme example but it keep it in because the the similarity between that kind of scene and the interior of a wild you know psychedelic experience is that they're these they're like theaters of power and your power is involved in that power and it navigates and it moves and it relates and some of it is scary and some of it involves submission, but it's not like a complete flattening, at least in my view, of that, um, that autonomy. It's like you're, auto you're autonomous inside of something you no longer control. So it's not the autonomy of the rational subject who understands their environment is manipulating all, everything to achieve what they want. It's not that kind of autonomy. It's almost more like a, it's a more raw bare bones 
autonomy that has to find itself in the midst of situations where it doesn't know really what all the rules are and that there's a kind of uh there's kind of an edge play with psych with sacred power and uh and there is some risk there and it's always a funny thing about risk because lots of people are perfectly happy with extreme physical risk they have no problem with the idea that some people would want to go up onto a mountain and put on skis and drastically increase their likelihood of breaking a body, sometimes really dramatically. And there's other more extreme sports examples that are, are far more likely, if you make a mistake, to do something terribly harmful to you. And nobody, it's not, it's, there's a sense of shame around it at all. And yet when it involves drugs, then there's much more of a sense of, oh, it's dangerous behavior, it's risky behavior. Okay, you've got to wheel that in. And it is, it is risky. And even more so with these kind of spiritual relationships, these sort of magical, poetic spiritual relationships that involve some kind of power slippage, like whatever else they are, healthy, unhealthy, dangerous, potentially transformative, the way it's always been done, a perversion of the way it's supposed to be done. That doesn't matter what I'm, for what I'm saying right now. They're just risky. They're kind of risky. It's like, oh, it's a cult. Let's go in. Are we doing this? Okay. Now, this doesn't apply to people who go in naively and get manipulated and were hoodwinked from the get-go and the kind of really coercive stuff that goes on. And that's a huge problem. And I'm not really talking about that, not because I don't think it's a huge problem, but because I don't think that's the only thing to talk about. And that often is what happens around these kinds of issues. It's like, because some people are coerced and because some people are terribly manipulated, therefore we should reject the entire model. And it's kind of like, well, oh, let's move to another field of risk where some people go and they don't really know how to ski and they watch TV and they think it's easy and they go up there and they go down and they break their back. Well, okay, well, that's clearly like really dangerous to have extreme controls over all this kind of behavior. You're like, well, sort of, but, uh, you know, so we get into a tricky zone about who's really responsible and who gets to take that. And so one way of dealing with that kind of ambiguity is to be really controlling and try to prevent these kinds of dangerous, risky situations as much as possible and, and train yourself to avoid them. Okay, that's one way. But another way is to also maybe at the same time, build up one, one's own autonomy and one's own sense of being okay, even in the midst of a slippery, strange situation. Uh, and such that that becomes part of the way in which we go through life is like developing the sort of like center of gravity that can find itself even in turbulent and disturbing situations, even when there's something ambiguous in terms of power plays between authorities or other, you know, people or other scenes. Um, uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's tricky stuff. And I, 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 you know, I'm in a way I also kind of want to keep talking about this to hear what you guys have to say, but I know that that's, you know, sitting is part of what we're doing here. And part of what I wanted to do, um, just do a little preface on the, on the sit, uh, is when, so when I think about power in sitting, um, you know, the phrase in, in Zen, they talk about Joriki, which is like self-power. So there's like self-power and other power. And self-power, it, it has different kinds of meanings. But um, for me, the, the, it really has to do with both concentration practices and particularly concentration practices inside the body and particularly inside the hara or the dantian. And those of you who've been hanging around for a while, you know, sometimes we'll do that in the, in the meditations is to focus on that center, you know, like two or three fingers below the navel, you know, an inch or two back in. There's this kind of like magic spot. But one way of thinking about this magic spot uh, is that it's where your center of gravity sits. So, for example, you're going down, you're climbing down a steep hill 
uh, you know, two legs, you know, going forward. And it's like, maybe there's rocks and slidey. And so you're like, you need to like ground as much as possible to get down that hill. Well, the best thing to do is to bend your knees slightly and sink your weight into your hips so that you're kind of like, you know, you always well, try to do this. So you're like, you're kind of like that, like you sink down, right? So you're, your your um your energy is your center of gravity sinks and that helps stabilize you as you move you know i think what uh, i might date myself here some of your the older folks will remember the advertisement for the the toy weebles which are these little egg-shaped creatures and the the tagline was weebles wobble but they won't fall down and you could kind of knock them back and forth and they kind of balance right up like this and you just knock them back and forth they balance right at like this there's a quality of balance that we can develop just in sitting let alone in arts like tai chi or qigong or whatever where they're really generating and using this center as a point from which you're motivating all of your action is kind of coiling and uncoiling from this point in the center of your body. So in martial arts, you get a really visceral sense of it, but there's also like a psycho-spiritual side to it where you're developing a kind of internal balance. And this is the kind of thing you can find yourself again, again, in the midst of extreme experiences, you know, fear, difficult, confusing situations, uh, whether or not they're internally generated or phantasmagoric or or real world uh, situation. So there's a way in which one can develop Joriki through a sort of concentration practice based on this um, center of the body. So I'm, I'm, that's kind of the, the intro. Uh, so let's, let's, let's sit now for, for a bit. Um, you're welcome to turn off the, the camera and just find your, find your spot. And for this one, you really, um, you know, want to be in a, a situation where the, the, the your, your, your best is possible. Um, you know, whether you're sitting on a chair, try, if you're a chair, try to sit in the chair so you breathe and you're not leaning back. Um, because part of this has to do with the kind of balancing of the spine in relationship to the Dantian. So first with the posture, make sure your hips are rolled forward slightly. If you're sitting on the ground, you have a good cushion under your bum so you, you can roll forward just a tad. And then from that, you know, even right now, just kind of sway a little bit, like let that spine sort of spiral around a little bit it kind of said well there's different angles where's the central where's the most balanced spot you know keeping your hips forward a little bit where is that really balanced spot and you know start there you can always reshuffle it but find that balanced spot and sort of unfold your spine upwards slightly modified as you kind of move up from uh the, the base of the spine finding a nice balanced posture, opening the front of the chest slightly, rolling the shoulders back down the back. So you have a sense of opening in the chest, but again, always in the context of maintaining a sort of balanced quality of uprightness. This balance also takes in the head, tucking the chin just a Back of the head pulled up towards the heavens just a bit back of the neck open spread once again even ever so slightly kind of spiral around or uh vary the direction of your spine just within you know within an inch or so and notice how you can find again that central balance point. And that action, which is a physical action, a proprioceptive action 
Oh, right. That's centered. That's upright. It's also a profound metaphor or a teaching to your soul, to your spirit about finding uprightness in the midst of unbalance or imbalance. Now that we have the posture, put your attention on the breath. And let's just breathe here for a few moments not focusing too tightly at first, just allowing the breath to settle. Allow re relaxation to occur, a kind of melting through the body, through the stresses of the mind. random thoughts, nervousness, tension, particularly on the exhale, just allow it to dissipate. Allow yourself to notice already a, a sense of presence, a sense of calm, and the capacity to tune awareness just by shifting your mind a bit, settling into a posture, drawing your attention to breathing, even in just a few moments, a kind of tuning process has opened up. So let's just breathe here for a bit. If you're feeling sleepy or sluggish, bring attention to the in-breath and the sense of vitality, almost like you're breathing in light. And if you're agitated, restless, focus more on the exhale. And again, with that exhale, allow stresses and distractions to melt down and settle. Tune into the energetic signature of the breath, by which I mean follow its physical sensation, but notice as well or taste the sort of sense of expansion and contraction, energizing and relaxation, this kind of energetic pulse. Is there really an energy? I don't know, but it's a wonderful 
and door opening analogy or metaphor. As you exhale, allow your attention to settle and to settle increasingly at the bottom of the belly. Almost as if you are exhaling from an aperture with your belly button. And gradually, don't need to force it, stay with that image so that you are essentially breathing in and out from this zone of the lower belly. So that your attention gathers there and sustains itself in that zone the attention towards the breath. So we're gonna stay with the breath pretty much through this sit. So while the breath makes a wonderful object to gather concentration, to bring our minds back to an object over and over again in the midst of distraction, I'm sure that's happening for many of us. There's also something that's happening energetically with attending to the breath, particularly at the end of the exhale and particularly in this area of the body. So that in a way you are layering both practices. You are both returning attention to a single object and you are energetically tuning this area of your body and allow it to get strong if you can. Not tense, but intense. So even as you allow relaxation to deepen, the breath to slow, settling throughout the body-mind to occur, bring a little bit of more to this zone, which you can imagine as a kind of sphere, a sort of like a ball of mercury or quicksilver. And it's as if your attention and you're returning to that area 
again, not with any physical tension, but with a slight focusing of awareness. It's a little bit like packing a snowball. You're not squeezing, but there's a sense of gathering around a, a circle, a sphere, a spiral. Another way to experiment with packing the snowball is to use what you yoga practitioners will know as ujjayi breath. And if you don't know it, it's simply a, but in a very subtle way, more subtle than in yoga, just a slight constriction of the throat so you're making a little bit of a sound as you exhale. I'm exaggerating now. But do that internally ever so slightly. And you will note, perhaps, that the sense of concentrated energy grows. From the other side, there is a slight tightening of the perineum between anus and genitals, just a slight tug up and even play with it a bit because when you notice it, it's quite noticeable, the difference that that makes. I'm not sure why physiologically, but it definitely helps hack the snowball. And again, all of these locks and moves which go against our instinct to just relax have to be balanced by a spirit of relaxing, of settling, maintaining structure and a little bit of intention, a little bit of intensity in an otherwise very spacious and relaxed environment. sink into that swirling ball. Don't simply be observing it from that strange little Cartesian theater behind your eyeballs. Allow yourself to descend in your body and to be that sphere of presence and power.
here you're in control. If it's getting a bit much, a little too intense, a little too tense, then relax while maintaining the focus, the general focus on the area. If you're feeling diffuse, lots of scattered thoughts, aimless energy, and really focus, almost see the sphere beneath the belly. Maybe it rotates, maybe it's full of fire, maybe it's liquid quicksilver, maybe it's just a sense. Concentration practice can take time, but along the way, it begins to help you. It becomes a perpetual motion machine, and it becomes easier to sustain the focus, the balance of relaxation and intention, almost as if this Quicksilver sphere is a kind of magnet. Stray thoughts and shifts in the body and external sounds, they all start to migrate on their own towards this sphere. Tune in for a moment to the quality, the sense of power. We don't use this term that much in meditation exactly, but for now, just see how this experience can unfold as a form of power or an avatar of power, whatever that might mean. a sense of body energy, a sense of excitement, a sense of presence, a sense of nobility, confidence, energy. And I invite you to play with the energy. So for now, imagine that sphere or feel that sphere growing smaller and smaller 
and smaller to a point or a tiny sphere, an atom. Is there a shift? Did it change color? Does your body feel different? Allow to expand again to the size you had before. A more familiar sphere, maybe the size of a baseball or a softball. And now allowing yourself to really tune into that energy. You are that presence, the presence that's concentrated in this zone. Allow that sphere to slowly grow. But as it grows, the sphere of your energy, of your presence grows with it. expands beyond your body. Becomes larger. Maybe now your whole sitting body is inside of the sphere. That presence and energy infusing the whole space. And it grows wider. Maybe it, it dissolves its spherical shape. It doesn't really matter. Allow the whole space you're in and longer, wider, farther if you choose. But really allow your whole space to be filled with that energy, that presence, and especially that sense of confidence and focus. If you lose the shape, if you lose a little bit of the uh, focus, that's fine. Just let it, let it dissolve. Nothing to do anymore. Let's just rest in this space for a few more moments before we close. But before we do, wherever you are, however expansive you, the space you find yourself, touch again one more time to the Hara, to the Dantian. Check in. See what it feels like. Maybe it feels like a, uh, you know, a socket you can put your finger in or a sort of uh, energetic source 
that you can return to even quickly. And that over time, it will only become clearer and more present and more available. Okay, let's, let's end the meditation there. Thanks for going on that ride with me, everyone. <laughs>